Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to St. Matt's Church here in Leeds online. Welcome to our Sunday service. It's a pleasure for me to be able to welcome members of the family, but also visitors. If you're visiting us this morning, it's great to have you with us. And we, we hope you feel at home and we hope you feel part of all that we're doing. Now then, for those of you who have kind of worked it out already, I am sat by the front door of our church building. And I thought I'd come here, well, for one main reason, really. It's great to be able to meet online. Zoom meetings are okay. YouTube acts of worship, they, they help us. But it's not the same, is it? I, I know all of us hugely miss that, that wonderful gift that God has given us of gathering together as an extended family to meet with him. The, these doors at this time would normally be pretty busy. What time are we on? Pretty busy with people who are kind of, quick, we're going to be late for church, who are charging in through these doors. But over the last 10, 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour, this church would have resounded with the sound of people gathering to worship. Children running up to the, to the service hatch to grab as many biscuits and, as they can, tea and coffee beginning to flow. People being greeted and welcomed with a hug. Chairs beginning to fill up, the sound of the band getting ready to lead us in worship. Uh, the person who's speaking sort of sitting nervously in the corner going, please, Lord, help. Give me some words to say life, family life packed into this building. And we miss that, don't we? And we don't know how long it will be before we're able to do that. But therefore, I think what is the next best thing for us? It's just for a moment to be mindful of the people that we would normally be gathering to worship with. Who would you sit next to? Maybe you'd be thinking of the visitors at this moment. Either way, I want us just to take a moment to pray for one another, to invite the Lord to inspire us this morning, open up our hearts to meet with him, to be mindful it's not just me and God, it's us and God this morning. So just take a moment and pray for God's blessing on all our church family, even though we're not in here. Father, we long for the day when we will be together again. But in the meantime, cause a hunger for you to bubble up within. Even this morning, cause that great desire to meet with you, to inspire us, lead us. Open up our hearts and minds and may your blessing rest on all of our friends and our family and the strangers and the guests who would normally be gathering in here. May your blessing rest on them and help them, help us as we gather to worship you, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So Chris Drew is now going to come and call us to worship and then we're going to worship together. Good morning, my name's Chris Drew and I'm married to Debbie and we have four children, Rebecca, Sam, Tabea and Josh. So how did we end up coming to St. Matt's? Well, up until last summer, we were living and working overseas in Asia. And when we returned to the UK, we chose to come back to Leeds because that's where Debbie's from. And also we chose um, Burley because we really like the um, diversity in this area. And if you look out the window, you can see that we live right across the road from the church. So we checked out our ch local church when we moved here and we all really uh, felt at home there straight away and there was never a need um, to try anywhere else. Jesus is really like my anchor or my rock. Um, ever since I've been following him, him whenever I face a time of difficulty or challenge, I always come back to the fact that Jesus um, came down to live amongst uh, us and he showed us that he was God uh, ultimately by dying and coming back to life again. And these facts uh, really anchor my faith. Well, there are so many to choose from, aren't there? Um, but I love the way that Jesus has time for people that others might ignore. I think about the woman who had 
had had a bleeding problem for many years and touched uh, Jesus' cloak in the middle of the crowd and was healed. Um, I love the way that Jesus is always in control, even though it might not seem like that to those around him. Um, And lastly, um, Jesus was a a revolutionary and a radical, always ready to challenge injustice and to show us a new way to be. And I find that really inspiring. When I'm outside, um, seeing nature and in the fresh air, I I find it easier to worship. Um, So as we come to worship this morning, I'm just going to read a few verses from Psalm 148, which talks about Uh, creation and praising its creator. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths, lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds that do his bidding, you mountains and hills, fruit trees and all cedars, wild animals and all cattle, small creatures and flying birds, kings of the earth and all nations, you princes and all rulers on earth, young men and women, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is exalted. His splendor is above the earth and the heavens. You were the word. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you, the silence could boast us in and grave. The heavens are rolling, praise our
Nothing can stand against what powerful name is the name of Jesus. What a powerful name is the name of Jesus.
Let's not rush away from this moment, but let's be still. And let's simply rest in the presence of God. You may want to continue to offer your thanks and praise, or you may simply want to be still, but let's, let's stay where we are for a moment. Father, thank you. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your care, your interest in us. Thank you for the beauty of your world and your creation. Thank you for the family that we're part of. Thank you for your spirit's comfort and for the way your spirit is shaping us. Thank you for the the death and resurrection, that glorious victory of our King Jesus. This morning, this is, this is what we want to be about. Praising and worshipping and glorifying you. We bless you, Father. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to hand you over to Nick, who's going to be speaking to us on the next psalm in the 150 Psalms in 150 Days Epic Adventure. Enjoy. Your kingdom come. It's a prayer many of us know really well, don't we? Um, it's inspired this 10 days of prayer, which is just around the corner and, and last year we used this image to, to help us and um, I guess imagine what it would look like for God's kingdom to come in Leeds and I'm aware as I sit here that it looks like the bird is about to land on my head or do something worse um, but as we come round this time to pray your kingdom come over those 10 days I find myself asking the question what does it mean to pray your kingdom come in a time of coronavirus what is a very different context? How do you pray that? Where do you start? What should we expect to see in response? So I don't know about you, but often I find myself praying your kingdom come from a place of actually, yeah, I'm not great, perfect, but actually I'm okay. Actually, the world isn't perfect, but it's all right. I don't pray your kingdom come from this place of desperation. And yet what I find myself needing now is a way of praying your kingdom come that does begin in that sort of place of desperation and actually it seems to me that's the way we should be praying the prayer anyway and today's psalm is psalm 79 and i think it really helps us to begin to understand how we can pray your kingdom come in a time of coronavirus the context of the psalm is very similar to one I spoke about a couple of weeks ago, Psalm 44. The Babylonians, the enemies of Israel, have invaded Jerusalem and have wreaked havoc. They have destroyed the city. They've defiled the temple. They have slaughtered people. They've come and they've gone and they've left people there amidst the ruins. And so this is the context that we begin. Um, let, let, let's read the psalm as it begins in that place. Verse 1. O oh God, the nations have invaded your inheritance. They've defiled your holy temple. They've reduced Jerusalem to rubble. They've given the dead bodies of your servants as food to the birds of the air, the flesh of your saints to the beasts of the earth. They've poured out blood like water all around Jerusalem, and there is no one to bury the dead. We are objects of reproach to our neighbours, of scorn and derision to those around us. How long, O oh Lord, will you be angry forever? How long will your jealousy burn like fire? The writer of the psalm begins by putting himself, by putting us, if you like, in the midst of this scene of devastation. If you like, he begins by surveying the scene. And what he sees is deep injustice, deep grief, and a real powerlessness in the face of what's happened. And so I think already the psalm has something to teach us about how we begin to pray our prayer, your kingdom come, is, which is to begin with simply surveying the scene. Simply, but so importantly, because actually 
only in surveying the scene do we lift our eyes up from from my world to see the reality of of God's world, of the world, so that we don't end up just praying your kingdom come in my little world, but actually, God, your kingdom come in your world, this broken world, to pray your kingdom come with both eyes open, if you like. And actually, that's painful. Henry Newman said, as he, as he journeyed, I guess, in his relationship with God, that he realised that much of prayer is grieving. That's how he put it, much of prayer is grieving. And so it seems to me that our prayer, your kingdom come in this situation, may well begin in that place of deep grief and, and complaint and pouring it out to God. A surveying the scene and holding it in our minds. But then I see the psalmist praying three things into the injustice around him. I see them praying for God's justice into the grief for his compassion and into the weakness and powerlessness. They pray for God's kingdom of power to come. Let's read verses six to 11. Pour out your wrath on the nations that do not acknowledge you, on the kingdoms that do not call on your name, for they have devoured Jacob and destroyed his homeland. Do not hold against us the sins of our fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us, O God, our Saviour, for the glory of your name. Deliver us, forgive our sins for your name's sake. Why should the nations say, where is their God? Before our eyes, make known among the nations that you avenge the outpoured blood of your servants. May the groan of your prisoners, the prisoners come before you by the strength of your arm, preserve those condemned to die. For the people of Israel, what they've experienced is, is just all wrong. And it's like they're praying, how can God, how can you just let our enemies get away with this? And so they pray for God's justice against them. But, but there is this tension in the psalm because even as they pray God's justice against them, they realize quickly they don't want to be on the receiving end of God's justice. And so very quickly, the change from verse seven to verse eight, do not hold against us the sins of our fathers. It's like they're praying God's justice against their enemies over there, but God's compassion over here. And I think this is where we need to just pause and ask, OK, well, but what does it mean for us to pray your kingdom come? Because I think there are some real similarities between our situation and the situation of the psalm. But but there are obviously some real differences as well. For starters, we know Jesus as king over all the earth and for all the earth. The Israelites understood Jerusalem to be God's inheritance, God's place, if you like, that he called mine. But we know, don't we, the whole earth is the place that God calls mine. And that's not to belittle um, the unique place of Jerusalem that, that it has in God's story. But we pray, do we not, your kingdom come on earth as in heaven. We have this privilege of knowing that God is for all the earth and over all the earth. And what this means, I think, for the way we pray is that the kingdom is not a zero sum game to pray for God's justice for us. We don't have to pray for God's justice against them. We get to pray God's kingdom for us and for the world. God cares about us. He cares about the world. So with that in mind, I think this psalm offers us a really helpful way to pray your kingdom come because we want to pray, don't we, for his justice, his kingdom of justice. We want to pray, don't we, for his kingdom of compassion to come in this crisis for his power to come. So with that in mind, how about his justice? In this crisis, we, we want to pray, do we not, for his kingdom of justice to come? I don't know if you heard a few weeks ago, <clears throat> Emily Maitlis, the BBC news reporter, who was criticising the mantra, you know, we're all in this together, we're all in the same boat that, that a lot of people were saying. And she, she very um, insightfully, I think, pointed out, actually, no, we're not. We're all, in fact, in very different boats, even though we're in the same crisis, because in reality, this coronavirus is having very different impacts across the different demographics of our society. Or if you like, it's exposing the already uh, present inequalities in our society. 
So we need to pray, don't we, for justice? As we survey the scene, where are the injustices that we need to pray God's justice into? God, may your kingdom of justice come. So we pray for justice, but as the psalmist prays for justice, as we saw, he realizes that actually the people of Israel themselves are in danger of falling the wrong side of that justice. And so they recognize quickly they can't pray God's kingdom of justice alone they, without praying for his compassion to come as well. Verse eight, do not hold against us the sins of our fathers. May your mercy come quickly to meet us. We're in desperate need. And so just as their prayer for justice quickly leads them into this prayer for compassion, it seems to me that for us too, our, our prayer for justice needs to become quickly a prayer for compassion. Compassion on us, forgiveness of our sins, compassion on the world. God, ultimately, we, we, we desperately need justice, but we desperately need your compassion. And this word compassion is a big word. It does mean, it does mean mercy and forgiveness, but you know, we have this beautiful image of his mercy coming swiftly to meet us. But it is more than that. The word, the Hebrew word for compassion is, is rechem. And it means mercy, forgiveness, but it also means the tender love of God, this, this loving feeling. And it originates in this Hebrew word racham. Notice the similarity, rechem, racham. It comes from this place of racham. And that word means wound. It's as if God's love, his compassion comes from a place of almost, strange as it may sound, his motherly love for the creation that he has, in a sense, birthed. That is so his that he feels a motherly concern and tenderness towards it for his people that he has created. God, would your motherly compassion and love and tenderness come to meet us? I wonder where are the places, who are the people you know who just need to know the, that motherly care of God's love. We're in a time, aren't we, where physical intimacy is really difficult and many of us simply don't have it. God, would you come? It's almost a, a craving, isn't it? God, would you come in your tender compassion and reveal it deep in my heart and in the hearts of those who need to know you? God, may your kingdom of compassion come. Justice, compassion, but also power. Verse 11, may the groans of the prisoners come before you by the strength of your arm, preserve those condemned to die. Because yes, they need to see God's justice come and be done. They need to see his compassion. But ultimately, God, we need your power. Ultimately, God, they, we need your deliverance. We need to be saved. And again, it seems to me, this is our prayer. As we pray your kingdom come, God, please show us your justice, show us your compassion, but we need your power. Please show up in power. We need you to heal the sick. Father, we need you to reveal yourself in power to our friends. We want people to know you. We want your name to be lifted high out of this crisis. We need you to come and act and show us who you are in all your glory and power. God, please deliver us from our, our weak. We're so exposed, aren't we, to the, the reality of, of our weakness, of the weakness of humanity in this situation. God, in this situation where we're finally so aware of our deep weakness and vulnerability, God, come and show your power. Come and show us your glory. Come and act. Show yourself as the God who shows up in power. As you survey the scene, where are the pockets, the people who really are powerless at this time, who are weak, who are vulnerable? Where do we need to see God's kingdom of power come? God, would your kingdom come in power? What does it mean to pray your kingdom come in a time of coronavirus? Well, I think this psalm gives us a way survey the scene, root ourselves in it, connect ourselves to the deep injustices that we see, but to pray his justice to come, to feel the grief, 
but to pray for his compassion, his motherly love to come and to recognize the weakness of ourselves and those around us and to pray for his kingdom of power to show up. But notice how the psalm doesn't end there. It's praise that has the last word. Verse 13, then we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will praise you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. Now for the psalmist, it's almost sort of conditional. When we see this stuff, then we, your people, will praise you forever. But, but we've seen it. We've seen God's justice, his compassion, his power, because we've seen the shepherd. We've seen these three things come together in our shepherd, in our king, in that moment on the cross. We saw his justice over evil. In that moment on the cross, we saw his compassion, that actually he took that evil on himself to return to us mercy, forgiveness, love, us and the whole earth. In that moment on the cross, we saw his power over even death itself. We have seen the king of justice, compassion and power. And his kingdom has come, it's begun. And we know his kingdom, he's going to come back and the king will come and restore this world to the fullness of his kingdom. And in the meantime, we praise him because we know the truth of it. And we know the shepherd who is here to lead us and guide us through. We're your people, the sheep of your pasture. What can we do but praise you forever and ever? and shout aloud about the God who we know who cares, who we know saves, and to see your power at work in the lives of our friends, of our society, of our nation, and even in the face of this coronavirus. So we pray your kingdom come, but praise has the last word. Let's just be still, see what it is God is wanting to say to us in the midst of all of this, all that the psalm has shown us, all that I've said, God, what is it that is true and that you want to, to speak into our hearts? Father, please would you use this time of thy kingdom come to teach us afresh to pray. And Father, would we emerge from this week as a people of praise. Praise in spite of what is all around us. Praise for the God who is king over all the earth and who shepherds us through and who answers prayer. Father, we worship you. Lead us now as we continue in worship.
all these bones to live, call these lungs to sing once again. I will praise all oh, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear. the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name, your name is a light the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name is a light. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence me, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. And Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus. Silence me, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Your name, your name is light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot be overcome. Is the life forever lifted high? Your name cannot be overcome. Your name cannot be overcome. Your name cannot be overcome. Oh, Jesus and Jesus, Jesus. Darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. You silence fear, Jesus, Jesus. You make the darkness tremble, Jesus, Jesus. Lord bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Lord bless you. Gracious to you, Lord, turn his face towards you and give you peace. And amen, amen, amen. you and keep you making space shine upon you be gracious to you Lord 
Now then, I've never used one of these before. This is a selfie stick. I'm feeling pretty young and reasonably cool at this moment. But anyway, we're gonna use this modern invention to go on a bit of a walk together. And the idea is I'm gonna take you to some places that we're gonna pray for. Now, this could go disastrously wrong, but, but I'm gonna give it a whirl. So. You'll see me in a moment, and we'll be at our first place that I want to pray for. So hold your horses.
So here's my first place. I don't know if you can see behind me, I hope you can, but well, this whole thing's not working. Anyway, here's the first place. This is a Burley St. Matthias school, the epic school that it is. Uh, in the playground, I don't know what will be happening at this time. I imagine it will be packed for the sound of children charging around, causing carnage wherever they go. The school will be packed full of kids learning and growing and sharing life together. Uh, and it's a really strange time for schools. It's a nervous time for schools. We're hearing that primary schools, like here, they're gonna have kids in greater numbers coming back pretty soon. And so what I want us to do is I want us to pray for peace and for energy and for imagination and for protection for the teachers and the head teachers. I want us to pray for the kids. This has been a strange time they've walked through and as they begin to head back to school for many of them, that could cause anxiety, couldn't it? I want us to take a moment to bless this school, to bless the teachers, the pupils, the parents, the families. Let's just ask for God to fill this place with his spirit and inspire everything that goes on there. Let's have a pray. So our next place, if you can work it out, is, I'm getting dizzy, Abbey Grange. I thought I'd come here because I know, I know for many people actually, they, for many of our teenagers, they really miss school life. This lockdown has created a real loneliness, like for all of us. We joke about, oh, it must be great to not have to take your GCSEs or your, your A-levels, but actually a lot of work and energy went into preparing for those exams. And then there's the teachers and the staff trying to work out how do they best support our young people? So again, I want us to pray for schools, secondary schools like Abbey Grange. But whilst we're praying, I also want to pray for those families that are homeschooling of all age kids. Homeschooling, for some of us, we're used to it and we're good at it. For others, disaster. It's really hard. So let's just bless families as they and carers as they homeschool. Bless secondary schools and pupils missing one another. Bless those who would have been having exams and are now trying to figure out how do they prepare themselves for the next stage. Let's have a pray and I'll see you somewhere else in a moment. Now I've come next to Kirkstall Road, you can see behind me. And I wanted to come here just to, to, uh, just to look at the, the shops, the pub, that are closed and, are, and have been closed for some time now and are gonna be closed for, for still quite a long period of time. And I know that the whole world is suffering. Nobody's finding this pandemic easy, but I often think about those who own businesses, who, who own some of these shops behind me people who are faced with, how am I gonna get my business going again? Will my business get going again? And my livelihood is at stake and it must be an incredibly stressful and frightening time. And so I want us to pray, to pray for those who run businesses, who run pubs like the Cardigan Arms, just to ask for God to, to uphold them and care for them. Let's, let's pray prayers of blessing over the businesses that we rely upon that are now closed. Let's pray. So I'm on my way to the, to the next venue to pray, but I've just been listening to the radio, so I thought I'd stop and, and talk to you about it and get us praying about it. I've just been listening to an interview with two police officers who've been asked, how's it going in this difficult time? And the response was, well, it's quite strange, but the biggest thing that we keep on having to go to are incidences of domestic violence. Now, we've prayed about this before, but we need to pray again and we need to keep praying. There are a lot of very frightened people stuck at home with, with dangerous people. There are a lot of people who are unable to manage their emotions and behave appropriately and well in homes. And it must be terrifying. And I think we need to carry the weight of that in our prayers. So let's pray for peace in the homes around us to reign. 
But let's pray particularly for those who find themselves in violent situations, that the Lord would help them get out, that ways out will be provided and they will be somehow supernaturally protected. Let's let's pray into this. I'm stood now in a part of the parish where I know there are an awful lot of vulnerable people who live. Claire's gran is in a care home here in Leeds. She's 96 and we, we worry for her. We know she's very vulnerable to this virus. And so I want us to take a moment to pray for those who are weak and vulnerable and particularly at risk in our communities. I want us to be mindful of those who are really at the sharp end of this and to pray for God's protection to pray for God's mercy, to pray for God's help, to pray for God's support for their families and for their loved ones. We hear a lot about this in the press, rightly so, and so let's get involved through our prayers. Let's pray. So I brought you, uh, before we head back to church, to my gym, Exercise for Less. Just as an aside, if, if any of you are watching this who work for Exercise for Less, maybe some of this free advertising, you might want to maybe knock some money off my subscription free. Just, just, just thinking. The reason I come here is because this is one of the places I come to, to unwind, but, but also to help me with my mental health, to give me some mental space, if I'm honest. We're hearing an awful lot, aren't we, about mental health during this pandemic, rightly so, because it does put a lot of strain on the internal workings of our lives, doesn't it? How do you manage your mental health? I, I've come here because I want us to pray about it, just to bring our whole well-being and the well-being of those who live down our streets and the well-being of those who live in our communities and just to lay them before the Lord and say, Lord, we're fragile, we're vulnerable, we can be mentally weak. I can be mentally weak at times, often. Lord, we need your help. So just before I head back to church, let's just stop and let's pray for the mental well-being of ourselves and those around us. Let's, let's pray. So I'm back. Now I want us to end our prayers by using a very old school prayer from St. Patrick, we think. Uh, it's part of what we call St. Patrick's breastplate. Now the words are gonna come up on the screen, but I'm gonna pray. And it's a way of praying for Jesus just to fill us and go with us and uh, well, you'll get the gist as we're praying. It's a fantastic prayer. So as we let's draw our prayers together by praying this together. Christ as a light, illumine and guide me. Christ as a shield overshadow me. Christ under me, Christ over me, Christ beside me, on my left and my right. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek yet all powerful. Be in the heart of each to whom I speak, in the mouth of each who speaks unto me. This day be within and without me, lowly and meek yet all powerful. Christ as a light, Christ as a shield, Christ beside me on my left, on my right. Amen. So we're coming, sadly, to the end of our time together this morning, but just before we bless each other, uh, one very important notice. We're coming up to Thy Kingdom Come. Thy Kingdom Come is this global movement where we pray for God's kingdom to come everywhere for 10 whole days, taking us up to the day of Pentecost. Now, I want you to watch, I'm going to give you some information about that in a moment, but before I do, watch this video to just whet your appetite and remind you of some of the fantastic stuff we got up to last year. Enjoy.
Thy Kingdom Come is a global prayer movement set up by Justin Welby and John Sentamu. It's taken flight across the world and lots of communities are praying throughout this week in the lead up to Pentecost for God's kingdom to come across the world and to transform cities and nations. So across the week we have been praying corporately and individually so we've had lots of prayer stations, we've had lots of different ways that have been um, creative and um, immersive. We've had lots of people come in who have never been to church before and um, we've had kids come in from schools. It's been great to see people come to morning prayers and um, and pray every day for, for our city and pray every day for each other. I can come is a great way to refresh my prayer life with God. Praying is the most important way for me to connect with God and having a regular way to do that is a great way for me to consistently um, pray um, and it's great to do that with other people as well. I think it's been quite amazing to come in at different points during the week and to see things that have changed. So extra words on the mirrors, um, more little people that have been built, candles that have been lit and stuff's changing and I just really hope that that means that people have had encounters with God and, and somehow amazingly it's felt each time like God's really present um, more maybe than usual. I came to have a look at each of the stations to see uh, what sort of things they were showing that we could pray for. I was particularly moved by the uh, refugee centre, uh, but the thing I mostly came back to uh, was the map of the city. Uh, felt drawn to pray for Leeds as a result of that. It's so important to pray because I, I think uh, it helps us get in sync with God, doesn't it? I think it's been a, a really exciting week. We've seen God move in lots of different ways. And um, what was really encouraging on Monday night when we were praying for the world, there were three people who came in from Brazil, um, just out of the blue. Um, one of them lives in the parish. Um, and so it was great to be able to chat with them and to invite them back to church. I think it's really important to pray for God's kingdom in a lot of different ways because God has given us this wonderful place to live and explore and live our lives. And yet, in many ways, the world that we live in is broken. And ultimately, we don't want to live in a broken world. This isn't what God created. And actually, by praying through it, hopefully his kingdom can come and it will just be so much better. We're praying because we want to see God's kingdom come and lead. And we want to see our communities and our, our neighbours and our friends and um, the city come to know Jesus and to know transformation and, and life that Jesus brings. As a prayer-shaped community, it would be great to grow in prayer and there's loads of different ways that we can do that throughout the year. So Thy Kingdom Come doesn't end here. I guess it's just something to encourage us in that journey of, of being a prayerful community. So here are some of the ways you can get involved. We're going to increase the rhythm of prayer and worship that we already have and use those moments to really seek God's kingdom. So watch this space for that. There's going to be a flyer with information coming to you. We're going to get to you either through the website or through email or through whatever means, a whole series of resources to help children, families, young people, whoever we are, to help us get praying and to resource us through those 10 days. So again, watch this space and the flyer to give you information about that. And then there's this, in my opinion, real challenge that Thy Kingdom Come is putting before us. Thy Kingdom Come is a moment for us to pray for those who don't know Jesus to get to know him. And so the challenge that we're being given is this, to text five friends or family members who don't know Jesus and ask them directly, how can I pray for you? I'm praying for you for the next 10 days, what things, big or small, would you like me to pray about? And then to get praying, and then after the 10 days, to check in with them and say, how's it going? I think that sounds amazing and challenging. Let's pray for it, and then we're going to bless each other. Father, we want to get stuck into this thy kingdom come movement. So help us to get 
ready for it. Help us to begin to think about those five people we're going to pray for. And may this be a moment where we see your kingdom coming in spectacular ways in our own lives, but in the lives of those around us. And we long to see our friends come to know you, Jesus. I pray in your name. Amen. Well, it's good to be together. And as we come to an end, let's bless one another with the blessing. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you, wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious towards you. The Lord turns his face towards you. And give you peace.